Well, thank you for joining us for the Inner Service Physician Assistant Program application guidance for selection year 2023. I'm Colonel MJ Ellis, and I'm here today with uh, Major Moore, Major McCampbell. I am the PA Associate Corps Chief and the Director of the Inner Service Physician Assistant Program. I'm gonna have Major Moore uh, introduce himself and then Major McCampbell. Hi, I'm Major Moore. I'm the Operations Officer for all of the PAs in the Air Force and then over to Major McCampbell. Hello, I'm Major McCampbell. I'm the OPAP Application POC. Okay, the Inner Service Physician Assistant Program is an advanced medical training platform that is unique it is a multi-service opportunity, and it is available to active duty enlisted and officers from any career field within the Department of the Air Force. That includes Space Force and Air Force. It's an accelerated path to a master's of physician assistant studies through our program underwriter, the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Okay, here's the overview for today. These are all the topics we're gonna to be discussing. We will go over what's in the guidance and then some questions that we received that are related to each of these topics. So let's start off with some key dates. The application window will open 1 October, 2022. So it's open right now. And the final day to submit an application is going to be 21 January, 2023. That is the same date that the audio interview is uh, supposed to be submitted as well. The selection board, we haven't set the dates for the selection board, but it should be open some, or we should have the board sometime between April and May of next year. And the results typically take about 60 days to come out on the PSCM. We will be selecting applicants to start classes starting next year, August. We'll have a December class. We'll have an April, 2024 and in August of 2024. So some questions that are related to that are how are the class dates selected and how are the phase one class start dates uh, assigned? So what that entails is looking at all the selectees. We look at who has their time on station, who has a DROS, who might have a selective reenlistment bonus that they need to finish uh, doing time for, and uh, who has a code 50. We look to make a mix of officers and enlisted for each class. We like to do a mix of medical and non-medical. And so all of those things play into how individual selectees are assigned to the class dates. So it is uh, an AFPC process and they handle all of that uh, kind of wheeling and dealing there for the class dates. So let's go to the next slide, which is the information resources. You will find these resources in the guide, guidance, and it tells you here where to find the guidance. Uh, there's uh, the KX, the Knowledge Exchange. You do have to get approved to uh, log into the KX. Pretty easy to do. You can go to the BSC page and find our guidance. You can go to the PA page. There are also the uh, MedCOE website gives you some information on that. And there's really good information on Facebook with the IPAP Facebook and uh, which is Air Force, which is specific to Air Force applications. And there is just a generic IPAP, which is mostly Army, but we have Air Force people on there as well. We really want you to read the guidance, look at the information that we've given you to find the answers to the questions you have, and start at the top and work your way down. If you still can't find the answer to your unique question, then you want to send an email to Major McCampbell, who's joining us today, and uh, you want to title that email, IPAP Applicant Inquiry, and send it to him for that question. But this is part of the application, your ability to read the guidance, follow the guidance, find the answers to the questions, and, and get this application started and completed. Most of it, everything you need is already out there. So some questions associated with the resources, where to find them, we've, we've listed those. And is the information on the IPAP Facebook page accurate? It really is. For the most part, we, I, I look through the IPAP web 
page. I answer questions. Uh, Major Graham, our education, SME answers questions. Uh, Major Moore is out there. We have uh, PAs out in the field that are answering questions. So for the most part, what you find on Facebook is going to be accurate and give you the up-to-date information. Always check the files section. Always do a search for the question you have before you post it because it's probably been asked before. All right, so the next section we're going to talk about is waivers. Uh, here's a slide that lists what is in the guidance about uh, generally no waivers are selected. And uh, that includes time and service, academic shadowing hours. In the past, we have had some waivers for uh, shadowing or the SAT because of COVID, but all that has been resolved. And so at this point, in general, no waivers are accept accepted. So some of the questions associated with the waivers is, should the waiver, the MFR be written to explain why there's a break in service? Absolutely. Anything that would have a board member reviewing your package, wonder why there was dates that were vacant or uh, just trying to help the board member understand your history, your whole application, highly recommend that you write a little MFR, use the tongue and quill, that's the next question, format, and explain things that aren't readily evident in your package. So pretty straightforward, MFR, tongue and quill, and if, if we need to understand your unique history, Write it down and help us explain that. All right, next we're moving on to military eligibility. First slide here has our enlisted eligibility, but grade, time and service, retention, active duty service commitment, which is the same for both our enlisted and our officers. So all that is listed in the guidance. Uh, we've got some questions uh, associated with the enlisted eligibility. All right, some of the questions associated with our military eligibility for our enlisted. We get questions all the time about time and service and will we go back to 14 years or higher for time and service? And at this point in time, we will not. We have so many applicants that are meeting our criteria that keeping that time and service low gives us a, an applicant that has a, a little more time and service that they need to go do those 10 years commissioned and their transition is a little bit easier. We find that they just have an easier time with becoming an officer and, and having a successful officer career. There's a question about age cutoff. There's, at this point, there's no age cutoff. You obviously, to complete your military career, need to have 20 years by the time you're 62. If you're already on active duty, you've met those age requirements. So we, for this program, do not have any age cutoffs. Guard and reserve, that's a question we get a lot. Uh, in the past, we have not had the capacity to have guard and reserve seats available to you. Now, the issue is we, while we have the capacity to have guard and reserve, the guard and reserve numbers are very healthy. And so at this point in time, they are not interested in hosting seats for guard and reserve. So potentially in the future, that may change. So keep checking back each year. Do I need to notify my career field? I highly recommend that you do notify your career field that you're interested in this program. You, for our enlisted, we've, I don't think we've ever had a problem with someone leaving enlisted ranks, coming to this program and getting commissioned. Uh, definitely for our commissioned officers, sometimes career fields are undermanned and we've had a few career fields in the past, hasn't been anything in the recent years, where they were not released after being selected. So kind of a sub question to that is asking about the projected out quota for retraining. For our enlisted folks, this is a commissioning program and it typically kind of trumps all other activities. And as I mentioned earlier, we have not had an enlisted career field tell us no when we have selected somebody for this program. Uh, being in the Space Force does not uh, it impact you in any way. You don't have to do anything different. You can apply just as our Air Force folks are doing. So nothing new, nothing different, and uh, just complete the application as we recommend. The control tour, I mentioned that earlier when we talked about assigning class seats. Uh, that is the control tour. We may have you 
in one of the late later classes because we want you to pay back more of that control tour, same thing with the uh, retention bonuses. So that's where the control tour impacts there. It doesn't prevent you from applying. It just may uh, impact which class you go into. And then time on station, there are absolutely no time on station requirements. Uh, if you have just PCS, we're again probably gonna put you in a later class. If you are on orders to PCS, that may get canceled and you stay in place and we get you into a sooner class. So, so all that is kind of an AFPC function. Once the board happens, the individuals are selected, then all that kind of sorting into the classes happens. All right, so next slide is gonna talk about our military eligibility for our officers. I don't think we got any questions on that one. And so I'm gonna be handing things over to Major McCampbell at this point. Thank you, Colonel Ellis. I'll be on slide 13 talking about academic requirements. The majority of our questions come from this subject. We get a lot of this. Uh, so as Colonel Ellis said, follow the resource contact list and sequential order that's put there on purpose and pay attention to the words like recommend, highly encouraged and mandatory. They have different meanings and are placed there very intentionally. And so if you get to the end of that list and email me, it's expected you've exhausted all those other avenues. Again, as Colonel Ellis said, opportunity to show the selection board that you can think critically to solve problems uh, without having to ping us for every single thing. Uh, but we're here to help if you need that. We here at IPAP don't have the resources and can't evaluate your transcripts. There is a, a very handy resource at UNMC that they have to evaluate for tuition assistance. You can submit your transcripts online and uh, the link will be in the slides to evaluate if you need to ask for tuition assistance. So that kind of has a twofold uh, accomplishment to, sell, to tell you that your courses count or that you need to take another course and that the ones you submitted don't count. So utilize that, but again, go in sequential order and not to flood anybody's email when we've already put that guidance out there. Uh, you can see in the guidance that CLEPS are available for many of the classes. One of the questions we get is upper level math. CLEPS are available for some of those. It depends on the course. So check on the CLEP and the guidance and then pay attention to those recommend, highly recommend and mandatory verbiage. There is a change or will be a change in the medical terminology course that's coming up. Formerly the AKO uh, that was accepted will be accepted for this iteration, but start, starting on 2024, that ALMS, formerly AKO course, will not be accepted following this year. So this year it is accepted and the ALMS, and the link again is in the slides, but next year in the 2024 iteration, it will not be accepted. Uh, the GPA question, uh, yes, the preceding 10 years is what is calculated for your GPA. And so this is a common narrative in many of the applicants that, hey, I started college 12 years ago, didn't have my life figured out and didn't get very good grades. And so this is a chance for those GPA uh, to fall off, but those courses can still count within the 60 credit hours, but just the GPA won't be calculated in the last 10 years and the math and science has to be within the last five years. There's a question about the different guidance between the services and the diff we have different selection boards for each service and each service is ultimately responsible for the PAs in their branch and they produce. Air Force, as Colonel Ellis alluded to, has no shortage of applicants and really the proof is in the pudding, you might say, in the Air Force where all of our students, Air Force students, are routinely at the top or near the top of their class yearly. And so we feel good about the recommendations or the requirements in our guidance that are specific to the Air Force. Prerequisites. A lot of question is, do, you, do I have to complete them or can I start them before I submit my package? And yes, you have to complete them before applying, before submitting your package. This is for several reasons. One, to ensure completion of the course to solidify your grade and your GPA for the selection board. And then two, it takes a lot of logistics to collect, coordinate, communicate these packages to the selection board and to wait on those grades or those completion of those courses is really not feasible. And like we said, we're, we're kind of rich in those applications. So we um, at this point can afford to do that. 
a question about uh, within 10 years and when does that 10 years start, whether I started the course or completed the course. The short answer to that is that less than 10 years is the month or you completed the course. So March 2013, if you started a or finished a course in March 2013, that is within the 10 years and would count on your transcripts. This is for the student's benefit and more recent prerequisite uh, is highly recommended to better prepare students for the rigors of the IPAP fast-paced program. And like I said, those courses that were completed more than 10 years ago will still count within the 60 credit hours, but are not calculated in the GPA. So courses that were a part of an awarded degree are counted like any other course, and regardless of whether a degree was awarded or not. Here's a question about the master's level science courses or different microbiology courses and all means all. All math and science courses taken within the last 10 years will be used to calculate the math and science GPA read straight off the guidance. So again, if you go through the guidance to read that and pay attention to the verbiage, you answer a lot of your own questions in that way. Statistics is counted in math and science GPA. So another question was asked about organic chemistry and C's and D's taken in other courses. Uh, while each participant or applicant is considered holistically, C's and D's are part of the math and science GPA and not as good as A's and B's, uh, to put plainly or kind of loosely. The better package you can put together, the better look you'll get by the selection committee. So a, a list of acceptable schools. Uh, there is accredited brick and mortar schools are traditionally better preparation for IPAP but the UNMC transcript evaluation resource again will help you with that. A question about the ASVAB, and if you look at the guidance, there is no mention of the ASVAB, so the ASVAB is not a requirement for IPAP. And then the question about SAT and why is that required? That is strictly for accreditation for IPAP, and so even if you have GED or upper level degrees, you still need to take the SAT. Question about the SAT scores and how they're sent to, to IPAP, when you take the SAT, it's pretty routine. You can select the schools that you send the scores to, and IPAP is a selection on that list. 3994 is the code. And now we'll kick it over to Major Moore for the additional documents. How you guys doing? So I'm Major Moore. I'm Colonel Ellis's operations officer. I've been, I'm actually an 09 grad for IPAP. So this is actually near and dear to my heart. So we're on um, slide 19, so additional documents. Personal letter. So personal letter, please, please, please answer the actual question for your personal letter. We want to hear from you. We want to hear from you as an individual and what ticks in your mind becoming a PA. So evaluation documents. So the Air Force, P, uh, the Air Force letter comes from the base POC, uh, and that is the PA that you will get your letter of recommendation from. The physician the commander and the senior enlisted evaluation all come through unicast our optional letter whatever you want to make for your option letter is wonderful uh, we can hear from a pa we can hear from a doctor we can hear from uh the sgh let us know that way we can see you as a person so slide 20 says what does the board look for in letter of intent and letter of recommendation what the board wants to see is from you. We want to see a person that knows you as an individual, not some person that has a bunch of rank, which is always nice, but we want to know who knows you, airman so-and-so, sergeant so-and-so, captain so-and-so. We want to know you as the individual. We want to get an idea of what, what makes you stand out as a person. So what stands out, next question, what stands out and holds more weight for letters of intent? Again, kind of like what we just talked about there's nothing that stands out or holds more weight what it does is if something speaks to the group or the committee about the individual so we get lots and lots of um, letters from very lauded individuals but they can may or may not speak to the individual we want to know about you what makes you the airman that wants to come to ipad so question number three since EPRs and wards are not required anymore for this cycle, what is the best area or in our package to highlight those details, PowerPoint, or that recommendation? So you, as the applicant, may not uh, 
upload your EPRs or letter of recommendation that or awards, but we do see them. So there's nothing to highlight in that general area. We will actually see them. So we're now in, in slide 21. So for our audio interview, so one minute maximum link submitted by email. Suspicion, uh, submission suspense is the 21st of January. We want to hear you as an individual. It's going to be fun. This is when you're going to stand out. We want to see what makes you as, an, as a person come over to IPAP. Slide 22. So what does the board look for an app, applicant and what makes an applicant a good candidate for the program? That's a great question and also a loaded question. We want, to, we want an individual that's well-rounded. We want an individual that's academically superior. Every single person that comes to IPAP Every, every person around you in seat to left and seat to the right is a rock star, as you as well. So we want that rock star to show up to IPAP. What is the board and who sits on it? So the board is, sits is the senior service rep, the associate core chief. Uh, we have a chief master sergeant. We have the operations officer. We have a, a phase two. We have another uh, field grade officer and we have a CGO, and we have one more uh, Lieutenant Colonel. That's who sits on the board for us. How are the packages graded? I think that what is kind of like the next set question, is there a ranking system like military promotions? There's not. So what we're looking for is a well-rounded person that would make it very well in IPAP. We're not gonna score a package and say, oh, you're a six or you're a seven, and now that you're in. We're looking for a person that is the holistic approach that is superior and that will crush this program that we have going forward. On average, how many applications are submitted per year? So it depends on the year group, but we usually have 100 applications or more per year. How many slots are available this year and does this fluctuate annually? It does. It does absolutely fluctuate annually. We have gone everywhere from 60 to 24. Are there acceptance, uh, separate acceptance slots for officers and enlisted candidates? There are not. So uh, officers and enlisted are considered together. So you're very much up against each other in, in the program. If someone was to have recently PCS when the board convenes, specifically overseas, will they have an impact on acceptance? It may. Uh, it depends on what your career field is and whether they can uh, release you. Well, being a single parent cause a loss of points. So there is absolutely no points for being a single parent. There's not like, oh, okay, you get two or you get three for being a single parent. I myself was a single parent. And uh, the what we want to talk about with single parents is that is a difficult course. We have a lot of hours as we go through IPAP. You're in class for about eight hours a day. day and the recommendation is you study that six hours a day when you get home. So it can be difficult as a single parent. So now we're on to question, if Milda Milk and spouse get signed to join me. So that is up, absolutely 100%, up to your spouse's assignments officer. We at IPAP, we have a 16 month program and then we have another program at phase two. If, it, if your program or your spouse can uh, PCS that route, good. Wonderful. We like to keep families together. If they can't, it's not something that we say yes or no to. What a CONUS PACS with report no later than date around the board results released to be turned off if selected. So if you get selected for IPAP, that takes precedence over other assignment. Would it play a part in which class the member gets received? Yes and no. Uh, we have three classes per year. And our classes are based on a whole host of activities, a whole host of ideas. And so your return or later than date will be taken into account too. Slide 23, all about shadowing. What is the preferred method to get in contact with the PA for shadowing? There is a uh, IPAP POC list that, uh, that you can get and it has every single base has a POC and how to get in touch with that IPAP POC. Is it preferable to shadow a non-IPAP POC that's within family medicine or an experienced IPAP graduate that works in different clinics? So when you come to IPAP, our, our goal is to graduate a family medicine P, at PAC. What we recommend is you get your shadowing hours however you can. 
And if it's with a non IPAP or an IPAP, that's fine. We like our your shadowing hours to be in um, the majority of them to be in family medicine or WAMC clinic. Will shadowing a surgeon physician count towards the required shadowing hours or does it have to be APA? Shadowing hours count. What we recommend, again, is that you shadow a physician assistant in family medicine. Do previous shadowing hours count? They do. We always shows that you are a app, uh, an applicant that has continued to try and want to be a PAC and that you're continuing that more education of what it means to be a physician assistant. Our next question, due to GS, MHS Genesis transition, applicants who have already met or exceeded the shattering hours are not able to continue. As a person that has MHS Genesis and has been seeing patients in MHS Genesis, I completely understand. It is a difficult process for all involved. Uh, what we recommend is that, that if you are done with your shadowing hours and that the clinic does not allow you to see any more shadowing hours, you just write us an MFR dictating that or noting that, and that way we can see it. I've been trying to get shadowing hours for the last few months with no luck. Will they be waived at this point? They will not be waived. What is the average shadowing hours for those accepted? It doesn't matter. The average shadowing hours uh, for those accepted does not matter at all. What we're looking for is a... Is a App, a holistic applicant. Fitness reports. So for someone who's been on profile more, more than once, we submit a memorandum explaining it all or different memor memorandums for each. Uh, exemptions will be fine. All fitness exemptions are failure to explain in one, step, in one MFR and upload in the unicast. This is include COVID. It does. And so now our parting words of wisdom. So over to Major Andy McCampbell. We are excited about your pursuit of being a PA. Uh, good luck in the application process, and we look forward to seeing you here at IPAP. So for mine, as uh, Major Moore, what we want and what I, you suggest is to be a superior applicant. So put up good grades from excellent schools and try diligently because the, when you graduate here, you be taking care of our families, our spouses, our children, and us. And so what we want is a person that will not stop and want to really and honestly care about each individual that they're taking care of. Because honestly, lives are on the line. And if you decide that you want to cut corners, then this may not be for you. It is a very specific and honorable career and we look forward for every application that's coming forward. And finally, over to Colonel Ellis. So we are looking for the whole person concept here. We want you to read the guidance. We want you to understand the guidance. We need you to be diligent, resilient, and motivated. We want you to understand the job that you're asking to become part of. This is a profession. And we want you to be able to bounce back when you have a, a difficult day at training at phase one or phase two, that we want, we also want you to understand besides the patient care aspect, being a PA, uh, and if you're not currently an Air Force officer, understanding the core that we belong to and how our career field fits into the Air Force Medical Service. We want you to come with your best intentions with motivation uh, and love and care for your patients. Because as Major Moore mentioned, you know, at the end of the training, there's a patient on the end of this training and you are going to be sitting as Major McCampbell uh, shared with me, this is a position of privilege that you are taking care of service members and their families. And so we need you to be educated on the process educated on the profession, and we look forward to seeing your application next spring. Thank you so much.